Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we will be discussing Depth of Anesthesia Monitoring Part 1. We will be discussing the early methods and modern methods. Regarding neuropharmacology of anesthesia, for awareness with recall to occur, there must be consciousness and formation of memory. The exact mechanisms by which anesthetic agents modify consciousness and memory are not fully understood. It is proposed that GABA-A receptors are implicated in learning and memory in studies of the normal state of awareness and sleep-wake cycles. Allosteric modulation of GABA-A receptor in hypnosis is important. Alpha-5 subunit containing GABA-A receptors are strongly implicated in learning and memory. Counter-arguments include Anesthesia is a distinct entity from sleep, being physiologically more akin to coma rather than sleep. Thus, studies of sleep mechanisms is limited in its relevance to accidental awareness in GA. GABA receptors is not the only molecular target for modulation of consciousness and memory. Halothane reduces cholinergic transmission in the reticular activating system. Propofol and isoflurane inhibits histaminergic transmission from the tuberomammillary nucleus in the hypothalamus, possibly causing hypnosis. There is no single anatomical center for consciousness that has been identified. Consciousness appears to be mediated by the coordinated activity of higher order cortical areas with both inhalational and intravenous general anesthetics selectively suppressing feedback activity in these areas. To devise better strategies to prevent AAGA, a greater understanding of the effects of anesthesia on consciousness and memory formation is required. During the early days, we use clinical signs to assess the depth of anesthesia. A patient who has purposeful movement might be conscious during general anesthesia. However, the patient may have no recall or memory formation of movements during GA. Movement responses under GA are chiefly mediated by spinal reflexes. Movement under GA does not usually correlate with recollection after general anesthesia. Absence of movement does not assure lack of awareness. Guido's classic signs of anesthesia are seen in patients pre-medicated with morphine and atropine and breathing ether in air and, are, and is devised in 1937. There are four stages, analgesia, excitement, anesthesia and overdose and there are four parameters measured, respiration, pupils, eye reflexes and respiratory reflexes. At stage 1 analgesia, the respiration is regular, small volume, pupils are normal. At stage 2 excitement, respiration is irregular, pupils dilated and eyelash reflexes are absent. At plane 1 anesthesia, respiration is regular, large volume, pupils constricted, eyelid and conjunctival reflexes depressed, pharyngeal and vomiting reflexes depressed. At plane 2 anesthesia, respiration is regular, large volume, pupils further dilate, corneal reflexes depressed. At plane 3 anesthesia, respiration is regular, becoming diaphragmatic and small volume, pupils dilate further, and laryngeal reflexes are depressed. At plane 4 anesthesia, respiration is regular, diaphragmatic, small volume, pupils dilated, carinal reflexes depressed. At overdose, respiration, patient is apneic, pupils are maximally dilated. Sympathetic stimulation can produce signs which may be used to assess depth of anesthesia. However, they are unreliable. Signs such as tachycardia, hypertension, diaphoresis, and lacrimation can occur in situations other than patient awakening. Sympathetic signs are not reliable in, in detecting AAGA. Heart rate and BP can be affected by hypovolemia, sepsis, beta blockade, antimascarinic agents, or anesthetic agents. Sympathetic activations may occur in the presence of adequate anesthesia. It may also occur, it may also be obtained by neuraxial or regional anesthetic techniques. The isolated forearm technique. It's simple, ingenious, and arguably the most effective. It is described originally by Tonstall in 1979. Firstly, the anesthetist agrees with the patient that the hand signs signals that they will use to convey awareness. An arterial tonique isolates the arm from drugs which enter the systemic circulation, such as muscle relaxants. 
Anesthetic agents may prevent memory formation at doses lower than those needed for loss of consciousness and immobility. Around half of patients who respond appropriately to their greed commands have any later recall of having done so. The downsides of this technique includes considerable degree of cooperation is necessary and ischemic paralysis supervenes after 20 minutes of tonicate inflation and prevents any further arm movement. We move on to the modern methods of determining depth of anesthesia. MAC, M-A-C. The end tidal anesthetic agent concentration, ETAC, is measured using infrared absorbance techniques. ETAC measurement enables real-time dose adjustments of the measured agent. Estimation of alveolar gas partial pressure and subsequent extrapolation at equilibrium, the plasma and end organ volatile agent partial pressure. MAC is the partial pressure of inhaled anesthetic vapor in the alveoli at one atmosphere, which will prevent 50% of subjects from responding to a standard surgical groin incision by visibly moving. However, immobility of a patient does not confirm irrefutably unconsciousness of that patient. We can monitor depth of anesthesia by brain function monitoring, which includes EEG and processed EEG. The electrical activity of cortical cells can be recorded by scalp electrodes. Scalp electrodes are used to assess EEG or EP, also known as electroencephalogram or evoke potentials. By contrast with an EEG, which contains information from superficial layers of the cerebral cortex, Evoke potentials reflect the pathway of stimulus perception from deeper brain regions. Electroencephalogram measures the spontaneous activity of cortical cells. Stimulus evoke activity detected as evoke potentials. EEG signals have less than 200 microvolt in amplitude, thus requires strong amplification. The frequency range are as follows. Gamma, more than 30 Hz. Beta, 13 to 30 Hz. Alpha, 8 to 13 Hz. Theta, 4 to 8 Hz. And Delta, 0.5 to 4 Hz. As the anesthetic dose is increasing, gamma band reflects neuronal signal transmission, particularly cortico-cortical communications. In awake patients, the main activity is in the alpha band. Induction of anesthesia, there is shift towards beta activity. As anesthesia deepens, there is increasing activity in the delta band. Higher doses of anesthetic induces burst suppression and EEG flatline. Overall, increasing depth of anesthesia leads to a general slowing left shift of the EEG activity. Limitations of EEG measurement. EEG only measures activity of superficial cortical layers. However, it is not known whether anesthetic agents induce unconsciousness by cortical or subcortical mechanisms. EEG is time-consuming and technically challenging to attach multiple electrodes to the scalp in the operation theater. EEG interpretation requires expert analysis. The raw EEG demonstrates differing patterns in response to different anesthetic agents and changes in response to events such as hypoxia and hypercarbia. And former EEG produces too much data to be of any practical use in the operation theatre. Processed EEG aims to overcome many of the difficulties of full EEG monitoring, which includes bispectral index system, e-entropy monitor, and narcotrend compact M monitor. It involves rapid analysis of the EEG waveforms with proprietary mathematical manipulation and modeling, which generates a power frequency spectrum, also known as an analysis of the degree to which different frequency waveforms contribute to the electrical energy of EEG. However, it is prone to interference artifacts from external electrical activity such as diatomy or electromyogram activity from facial muscles. 
Next, respiratory sinus arrhythmia and RR interval variation as a measure of depth of anesthesia. It is only applicable in the presence of an intact autonomic nervous system and healthy myocardial conduction system. It is thus not reliable in patients on beta blockers, patients having autonomic neuropathy or dysfunction, patients who are septic or have cardiac conduction abnormalities. It enables assessment of brainstem function, which decreases with increasing depth of anesthesia. Esophageal contractility can be used to assess depth of anesthesia. The amplitude and frequency of contractions of lower esophageal smooth muscles reduce with increasing depth of anesthesia. However, there are high rates of false positive and false negative results. Lastly, frontalis electromyogram EMG can be used as well. Amplitude of the EMG decreases with increasing depth of anesthesia. However, this method cannot be used in paralyzed patients. These are my references. Thank you.